Good evening and welcome to the regular city council meeting of Monday, September 24th, 2018. At this time, can we have the roll call, please? Council Member DeRosset? Here. Council Member Lane? Here. Vice Mayor Klein is absent. Council Member Rhino? Here. And Mayor Vieira? Here. Next, we will have the invocation by Lauren Gregory of the Victory Assembly of God, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, and once again, Lord, we ask for wisdom, Father, as we decide the people's business. God, be with us. Let us be unified with one mind and one heart and decisions that we make, God, that will be great for this great city. And we ask these things, Lord, in your holy name. Amen. 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 I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty we have one presentation this evening. State of the Education in Stanislaus County presentation by Tom, Tom Changdon, Stanislaus County Superintendent of Schools. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council members and staff and uh, the esteemed audience uh, that were gathered here tonight. Thanks for having me out. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, give you a brief update on what's happening with uh, education in Stanislaus County. And uh, I was telling a friend of mine, we were talking, you know, the weekend activities. My wife and I went to a wedding over the weekend. I said, boy, this wedding was really emotional. And he said, it was. He said, wow. Well, how emotional was it? And I said, well, it was so emotional, even the cake was in tears. <laughs> Jim, you like that? Anyway, the point is, this report is, is not to bring tears in anybody's eyes, but to share the good things that have been happening in Stanislaus County. So this is the state of education. I want to just give you a little background as we get into this about how uh, the students and the demographics have changed in our county and in the state of California in the last uh, decade or two. You can see that since 1980, we're educating over 2.2 million additional students. And we have built, uh, we have actually only built a handful of schools to accommodate all these students. So when you talk about schools that are really overcrowded and classrooms that are run down, that's because we haven't kept up with the number of students that have entered into our California school system. Here's a pie chart that shows the demographics of our uh, California schools in 1980. And you can obviously see the two primary uh, races are white and Hispanic. Now notice uh, the percentages there. And let's fast forward to today, and here's the new chart. So as you can see that we've done a flip, basically, of our demographics of students, which is fine. The challenge that our schools, though, as a result of this, of that 54% that are now Hispanic in our classrooms, of that number, approximately 85% of those are what they call EL, English learner students, which means they go home every day and speak another language besides English. And so it does present a considerable challenge for our educators to make sure that they acquire English while at the same time learning how to read, do math, according to the standards that the state has been set. And for many, many years, you've said, we've got this achievement gap in California, and we've got to close that gap. But you can see the challenge lies in the fact that we're trying to close a gap on young people that are still trying to acquire the English language and then get current at grade level with all the other curricular assessments. So it does present a bit of a challenge. Uh, in California, we have 10,000 schools, and in Stanislaus County, we have 187, and the breakdown, as you can see right there. I come and I share, many of you have heard me talk before, about a book written by Jim Clifton. He is the CEO of the Gallup Poll, and everybody's heard of the Gallup Poll before, and Jim has done a world poll for the last six years, and he asked people that, do, that fill out their survey says, what's the most pressing concern you have as a person? And this is a worldwide poll. So when I was thinking about it, I said, okay, terrorism is a real threat. That's a concern to me. What about our economy? What about health care? So there are a number of things that came up. The number one, six years in a row, the number one concern worldwide are jobs and the availability of jobs for the person taking the survey, but most importantly for their children 
They're concerned about, will my child have a job that will allow them to live the American dream? And so that's a real concern for me. And it's supported by the fact that not too long ago, I attended a conference in Los Angeles. The night before, in the lobby, there were hundreds of students that had come over from Japan. And I said, went up to them. They were dressed very nice. They spoke perfect English. And I asked them, well, were you here to go see Disneyland, Magic Mountain? What's, the, what's going on? And they said, no, none of that. We're here to look at career opportunities in America for us. And these are jobs that we want our children to have. We don't want these jobs necessarily to be going to other countries. But the point is, these students are prepared, they're hungry, and they want a job. And so we really need to focus on making sure that our young people are adequately prepared with skills and a sense of purpose of what they want to do. Find your passion and then pursue that passion. So that's really important. Here's kind of the state of where we are kind of technology wise. You know, uh, people, the students, I'll go into classrooms and they'll, I hear them tell the teacher, well, why do I need to uh, do spelling anymore? Because we just have spell check on the device. <laughs> it just, you know, and with texting and everything else that goes on, the old style of teaching has really gone out by the wayside. We have to adapt to the way young people are learning right now. But many young people report that they, after they get into the real world, do not feel that they've been adequately prepared for the shock of, wow, you mean I have to work like 40 hours a week and be there on time and understand how to work collaboratively with other people? I mean, that's like... Nobody taught me how to do that. Well, we need to make sure that we do that. Soft skills that so many of our businesses are, they're really desiring young people that have those soft skills. So we need to focus on that and uh, do a better job. I'm here to tell you that in the 12 years that I've been in this position, I've had the honor and the privilege of serving as the county superintendent. We've done four countywide initiatives and these have been very successful. The first one we did was Everyday Counts, and you can see with that third bullet, we generated over $3 million into our local school districts just because more students attended school more regularly. So it benefited schools with revenue, and obviously when you're in school, you're learning. By the way, those Japanese students told me they go to a school an average of 232 days a year. The most we go to school in California is 180. So take 50 days a year times 12, and that's the number of instructional days more that students in Japan are receiving than they are here in America. Next up was, of course, our initiative called Fit for the Future. And then Governor Schwarzenegger selected Stanislaw County two years in a row as the Fitness County of the Year. And he would take me around the state with him and I would promote our county on how we were able to get families and schools coming together to get more active. And as a result of that, three of our local districts received $100,000 gyms as part of the fitness uh, challenge that we did. And then we had, of course, a few years back, everybody remembers Choose Civility. And I think two of the highlights of this, this um, third bullet, the fact that we had over 250 local businesses that partnered with Choose Civility. So, for example, on Casual Friday Day, Dress Day, the employees, employers uh, would allow the employees to wear a t-shirt that would say, just be nice, or things like that, to help promote it. And I wanted you to know that um, we took this on the road, Choose Civility, and seven other counties in the state of California adopted what we were doing to use that. Some people actually have come up to me and say, Tom, we need to uh, revisit Choose Civility in our society today, and there's some truth to that. Well, I'm here to tell you that in the past five years, we started a new, this is our fourth countywide initiative. So that means it's all of us working together on this. It's called, it was called Destination Graduation. And we based it on looking at what school districts are doing to uh, get students to graduate. Because in our county five years ago, there were an average of 900 freshmen that started school at a local high school in our county that did not walk across the stage four years later and get a high school diploma. Well, that's, that's not acceptable. Because how are those students ever going to think they're going to live the American dream? 
or have a lifestyle that is anything remote to being what we would like to see in our communities. So you can see that we started this initiative. Our high school graduation rate was 78%, and five years later you say, well, it didn't go up much, Tom. What the heck are you guys doing? It went up 84%. That's a big jump. That's a big number for high school graduations. And I'm here to tell you that a couple years ago, they flew me back on the East Coast to speak at the National Dropout Convention. And when I was back there, I had, after my presentation, I was swarmed by educators from large urban schools, from Detroit, from Baltimore, from Washington. And they were saying, Tom, what is your secret to success? And I'm thinking, look, we're not proud of 80% at the time. We can do much better. In those large inner cities, dropout rate, 50%, 50%. We're losing that next generation. And they can't contribute to our society and our economy can't sustain that. So we have to turn it around. So I'm just happy to tell you that we are well above the state average now in our county for graduation rates. So we're headed in the right direction with that. One of the uh, items, uh, one of the best practices that we had is um, this gentleman uh, with me was a high school classmate of mine. And his name is Steve Wozniak. That name might ring a bell. He invented Apple Computer. How about that? He and Steve Jobs created Apple Computer out of their garage in Cupertino. My wife tells me, Tom, you should have spent more time hanging out with the Electronics Club. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I reconnected with Steve at one of our high school reunions and asked him to come to our county and talk to young people about what it's like to be an entrepreneur, to think outside the back, the box, and always ask questions. What if? What if we did this? What if we did that? And I can tell you that we had a thousand people show up at the Gallo Center that were interested to hear his story. It was really wonderful. So we had things like that going on. And then we had recently, we sent two of our employees back to Philadelphia, where we received the State of California Pace Setter Award for what we're doing in the area of early childhood literacy. This is a big deal. It's a big deal, and we were proud to go back there and accept that on behalf of the state of California. So we are headed in the right direction. We have our challenges. There's no question about that, but we are moving the, the needle in the right direction. I want to tell you about two other programs. First of all, this Comeback Kid program, we started uh, a few years back, and the idea was let's see if we can get high school students that dropped out for whatever reason to come back and get a high school diploma. And wouldn't you know, look at the numbers right there, they speak for themselves. We have issued 800 graduates high school diplomas since we started. We're not talking about a GED, these are high school diplomas. And at every one of the graduations, there's not a dry eye in the audience. Our last one, we had a 41-year-old mother of three, was our speaker. And she said, I came back to school for two reasons. One is my family sitting in the front row. How could I tell my three kids that education is important and yet I don't have a high school diploma myself? Well, I, that's, that's being hypocritical. I can't do that. And the second reason she says, more important for me, I've always wanted to work. I want to work. But without a high school diploma, it had prohibited me and kept me from doing that. Currently, we have uh, over 800 students that are enrolled in the program. It's ongoing. Most of you know the County Office of Education bought the former Modesto B building. And inside that building, ooh, it's no secret what's going on there. This is a game-changing uh, activities that are going on in there. We're going to have a, it's a full service vocational training center. So in the back where they used to have the big presses, we have a partnership with the Volt Institute. And what you do is if you want to learn how to become a carpenter, any kind of trade, you come in there and they're gonna skill you up. Whether it's electrical or plumbing, masonry, you want a certificate to drive a forklift, come on down. What, you've got children and you have daycare issues? Bring your kids with you, because the building, we've installed a huge daycare program. You take your lunch break, you come up, you read a book to your child, reconnect and you go back and you get your school. We've got the high school diploma program going on right there. These graduates that you see, these men, and it's open to women, obviously, but this first cohort that went through, you can see that of the 30 graduates, 90% were offered good paying jobs before they got their certificate. And that's what we need, because we're aligning what the employers have 
uh, their skills with what the jobs are that are available. So we're very excited with the programs that we have at Volt and uh, we're moving in the right direction. You can see all those jobs that are available. And I just want to let you know that um, moving ahead, we're wrapping destination graduation up and it's being morphed into a new initiative, a new countywide initiative. Get ready, hold your breath. It's called Cradle to Career. And this is another one that you're going to hear about because it encompasses all of our community members. And I can tell you that we want to focus on young students before they even get to kindergarten. Because, ladies and gentlemen, that's where, that's where the gap begins. Do you realize that for the first time our county started using a kindergarten assessment? so that preschool teachers, Head Start teachers, can give this assessment to young people to determine. They can go to the kindergarten school and say, well, this child is ready or not. In our county, our first look at this, 31%, 31% of our young people are ready for kindergarten. So that's a problem. That's a problem because how are they gonna be reading at grade level by third grade? We've got a lot of, catching up to do. And that catching up to do has to do with getting books into the homes of these young people, helping parents to understand how to play and read and spend time with their children so that they are truly ready for uh, kindergarten as we go. So we have these pillars with the Cradle to Career. It's a great program. We're already very invested in it. All the school districts are on board, and um, we have a number of business partners that have already stepped up, and, and we're excited about this because it's cradle to a career. And along the way, we want to make sure we don't have students falling through the cracks. So uh, in a brief nutshell, that's uh, the story that I'm saying because here it is, to dream is to be filled with hope. And we see the faces, every time you look in a child's face, you see hope. And I tell people that I work with and I'm around in education, we have to be hope salesmen because we need to make sure that young people have a vision for themselves living a productive life in a great community in Stanislaw County. City Council member, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Now you know the backdrop and what we're doing moving forward, Cradle to Career. Look forward to your uh, involvement, and thank you very much. It's been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Were there any questions? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, we'll move to citizens communication to council on matters not included on the agenda. While the City Council welcomes and encourages participation in City Council meetings, adopted rules allow no more than five minutes for expression of non-agenda items. Matters under the jurisdiction of the City Council and not on the posted agenda may be addressed by the general public. However, California law prohibits the City Council from taking action on any matter which is not on the posted agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the City Council. Citizens are entitled to address the City Council on any agenda item subject to the five-minute provision. At this time, I do have one speaker card, so I'll call um, Shirley Rogers first. This is totally out of my comfort zone. Uh, first off, I belong to uh, Facebook, and there's an app on there that's uh, called Nextdoor, and I belong to the part that's Bluebird. Drive. And the people are very upset about Rose Ave and Rosewood Ave with speeders. And so they're suggesting <clears throat> that they'll go out and take a camera and they'll take a picture and then somebody will get a ticket. Well, that's really not going to happen. Secondly, they suggested that they just keep calling the police. Well, we already know we don't have enough police. So I researched all I could on how other cities might have taking care of this problem. And there are vehicles that are portable that will take a picture of a license plate and the speed so that tickets maybe legally could be given. And you could move them from street to street so nobody would know where they were gonna be. That's the one thing I want to speak on. The second one is Delhart. I had company come from Oceanside 
and I took him to dinner at our local Italian restaurant. And I parked in front of Dale Hart's. So I was met with a whole street full of mattresses and rollaways. Why? Why? Why is he getting away with that? He has beautiful display windows. If he wants to display, display in the windows. Why are you not citing him? Can anybody answer? Nobody's going to answer. I already figured that one out. OK, that was number two. I have one more. Mrs. Rhino. Yes. I would not refer to any of you up there as a gang. Would you please not refer to the local motorcycle clubs as a gang? Mrs. Rogers, I had, this happened many months ago, that I had someone contact me, and when I asked the chief about it, that was exactly what I was told. And all I did the was chief ask. chief is full of BS because it is not a gang. They are chartered. They are a legitimate organization. They are taxpaying citizens. I would like to see them treated like that, the same as I will treat you like that. Well, I don't believe I referenced any specific group. That's right. You, you were just all of them, any unnamed, but nobody's dumb. Again, if you came to me and you asked that same kind of a question or any kind of a question no, of your, you if you're a council public, member, I did it in public. If you came to me as a council member and asked the question, I would have done the same thing for you. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. All right. Um, is there anyone else that would like to address the council on a non-agenda item? Please come forth and state your name. Yakely series. I'm here again. Nobody seems to. Maybe you can move the mic up a little bit higher. Thank you. I'm here again. Can you hear me? There you yep. Go. G. Yakely series. I've been here several times, probably in the last four or five years, bringing up this issue. And a lot of that issue is right there on the wall. You know, when you run for city council, mayor, uh, senator, governor, congressmen, they all have rules to abide by. They have to sign a statement saying that whoever posts them will be responsible or whoever they appoint to post them will be responsible. These signs today were taken down by me with permission from the managers, the Maceo family in uh, Westward Ho uh, trailer park over there on Mitchell Road. She did not give these people permission. These signs are all over the county. They're in series, they're on telephone poles, they're all over the place. Oh, and let's not forget all the garbage that's all over the place, abandoned cars and various other things that you can review here. And the most recent one, I believe, is uh, uh, there's something going on at the uh, uh, convention center or whatever they call it, downtown Modesto, a home show. They got signs around town too. I just can't believe that people live in this city don't see this going on. I mean, am I the only person that, that's concerned about this? You know, the garbage and all the other stuff, it seems to be going the other way. You gotta remember, some people that, maybe the ones that sit up here live in pretty decent neighborhoods. And I'm guilty because I couldn't afford to buy a brand new home by myself in that particular neighborhood. The one I bought was brand new. Now the whole neighborhood's changed, you know? And it's not because of me. Uh, there's abandoned cars in my own neighborhood besides that one there. Uh, people parking on lawns in the driveways with dismantled cars. Uh, it just goes on and on, and a couple of pictures there are just a block away. There's garbage, they just throw the whole house, it looks like, in front of the house. All the, the fixtures in the house, the furniture, the mattresses, everything. Sometimes toilets and stuff. It just goes on and on. If you got a budget, and you do not get more code enforcement, nothing's gonna change, nothing. It's gonna continue and it's gonna be a dump. It's gonna get worse and everybody that lives in this town, especially the ones that notice all this stuff, they realize that you have, 
without a doubt beyond anything else. The police department, the fire department, they're out most people, they need their help too. But without co-enforcement and cleaning up the city, it's not gonna get any better, it just gets worse. And as far as the signs, those over there, Toby, I gave you some before. You might wanna call these campaign people and tell them to come get their stuff and keep it out of our city if it's not posted correctly, especially on utility poles and private property. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council on a non-agenda item? Okay. Hearing none, we will move on. We have no appointments to boards and commissions. Conflict of interest declaration. Is there anyone on the council who would like to declare a conflict of interest on any of the 13 consent calendar items or two new business items? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to the consent calendar. All matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be enacted by a single motion unless otherwise requested by an individual council member or public for special consideration. Otherwise, the recommendation of staff will be accepted and acted upon by roll call vote. This time, is there anyone on the council who would like a consent calendar item pulled for further discussion? Item 12. Okay. And Mayor, on mm. item 8, I will need to abstain from that. Okay. Okay. Anyone in the audience that would like an item pulled for further discussion other than 8 or 12? Okay, hearing none, I'll bring it back to the council for direction on the other items. Move to approve 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, A, B, C, D, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, and 13. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council Member DeRosset? Yes. Council Member Lane? Yes. Council Member Rhino? Yes. And Mayor Vieira? Yes. Motion passes 4-0. Okay, we will move to item number eight. Um, we'll take it separately, because I think you were just, conflicted out. I just conflicted. Okay. So are there any questions of staff on this item? Okay, anyone in the audience have any questions on this item? <clears throat> okay, I'll bring it back to the council for a direction. Move to approve resolution number 2018-102. Second. Do we have a motion and a second? Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council Member DeRosset? Yes. Council Member Rhino? Yes. Mayor Vieira? Yes. Motion passes 3 0 with one abstention by Council Member Lane. Okay. Uh, the last one, item number 12, resolution number 2018 106, ratifying the memorandum of understanding between the City of Ceres and the Ceres Police Officers Association. Council Member Rhino? I agree with almost everything that is in the MOU, um, specifically the additional 504,000 that we'll be spending on the police officers. The only thing that I can't agree with is the retroactivity because we did not give that to any other group and I don't believe that we should, be, we should signal out any particular group and give them retroactivity. That's my only comment. Okay. Any other comments? Is there any comments from the audience? Anyone would like to address the council on this? Okay. Hearing none, I'll bring it back to the council for more discussion or direction. I move to approve resolution number 2018-106. Second. We have a motion, a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council Member DeRosset? Yes. Council Member Lane? Yes. Council Member Rhino? No. And Mayor Vieira? Yes. Motion passes 3-1. Okay. We have no unfinished business this evening, no public hearing. We have two new business items. The first one is the Series West Mobile Home Park. Mr. Wells? <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. This uh, is our third conversation regarding this topic, uh, not one I'm uh, pleased to bring back for your consideration. However, uh, we are up against a deadline um, for a public hearing that has been scheduled by the State of California Water Resources Control Board on October 1st. And at that hearing, we are, have been clearly told uh, that we will be forced to provide water to the Sears West Mobile Home Park. Uh, so in light of that uh, looming uh, meeting and seeking council direction, uh, we put this item together to ask uh, one last time for the council's consideration of whether we should provide water um, and negotiate a water sales agreement with the Series West Mobile Home Park 
rather than have it forced upon us by the state of California. Uh, it's a rather unfortunate circumstance. Several of the laws relative and regarding uh, these small public water systems, and I use that word very carefully because that is what the state has determined, that a mobile home park that provides water to more than 50 customers is considered a public water system and therefore under the state's jurisdiction. Um, rather unique, and um, I, I would think uh, Mr. Hallinan would agree that the legal framework for that is rather interesting, um, but it appears they have the legal authority to do what they're threatening to do. So as a result, uh, we have reached out to um, the owner of the mobile home park and uh, sought the assurances that this uh, council has put in place with the Monterey Park track. Uh, the difference between those two, we need to highlight that. One, Monterey Park Track is a district, so it is an elected body governed and overseen by Stanislaus County, and under that arrangement that we had with, with Monterey Park Track, the county was the backstop. So it's a three-party agreement with the county backstopping all of those efforts. In this particular case, we don't have that luxury uh, in that it is a privately owned mobile home park that serves around 41 um, properties. The property owner has provided, which is in your packet, um, some significant assurances that were not provided previously in the two um, conversations we've had about this previously. So one of those, the willingness to put uh, basically a deposit with the city for up to six months worth of their estimated um, bill, which I think is significant because previously they were talking about a bond or some other th framework, they've now said we'll just deposit that amount into the city and maintain that amount with the city. So if something went wrong, we would have at least six months, or if council wanted longer, we would be able to have that money in, in the bank. And that's a similar deal point that we had with Monterey Park Track. Uh, they've also um, provided some documentation, some legal framework, and now have an attorney involved to uh, provide some assurances in terms of long-term maintenance, um, putting the bond in place or some other mechanism that we would approve, and then also uh, recording the water sales agreement so that it ran with the land. So for any reason, this owner uh, sold the property or it changed hands that any successive owner would be uh, on the hook for these same uh, restrictions and things that we would be no negotiating uh, under this framework. So, uh, you know, it's a very large packet. Uh, I gave you, um, I think as Diane said, there's more pages in this particular item than the rest of the agenda together because uh, I wanted to give you the entire framework of everything that's gone on from uh, basically the first conversation in 2016, follow-up conversation in 2017, and when this council said no in 2017, that's when the state really kind of jumped into motion and started to flex their muscles, so to speak. So this council took action uh, uh, July of 2017 and said no. Then the state sent this letter and said, you have six months to negotiate it or we're going to consult force the consolidation. Uh, we asked for six more months uh, in February. They granted us that. Then they scheduled their first public workshop um, with the residents of the mobile home park on May 30th of 2018, earlier this year. Uh, city staff participated in that meeting, educated the, um, the residents there of the mobile home park and their expectations. Uh, the owner was there as well, so was the state, and the staff from the state at that meeting was very clear that uh, they were going to force this consolidation whether we liked it or not. Um, again, we reached back out to the owner to see if they could provide us some information. They got that to us this month. We scheduled this meeting uh, in advance of that uh, meeting on October 1st, uh, Monday. So look for your direction. Um, obviously, from a staff perspective, we're going to go to that meeting on October 1st, um, needing to be able to tell the state in that public workshop what, uh, where we're headed with this um, options. From a staff perspective, we don't like it. Uh, we're not uh, very firm in recommending uh, negotiating a water sales agreement. However, um, we are very convinced the state's going to force us to do that. They do have the legal authority to do it, um, and we're in a better position to negotiate on our terms rather than having those terms forced to us um, by the state. And I, I don't, I make that recommendation um, very lightly just because of the concern of all the things that we've talked about before. Uh, the opening of Pandora's box and other potential um, people with similar water quality challenges um, Probably one of the most frustrating aspects of this request is the water quality that we'll be providing to the mobile home park is exactly the same that they have today because we have the same challenges that they do. Uh, in the state's mind, we're a bigger water system. We have the ability to fix it easier than they do, and we fundamentally disagree with that premise. Um, however, um, we've tried every angle we've known to try and argue against that, 
and uh, it's pretty much fallen on deaf, deaf ears and the, the state seems pretty determined to move this forward. Um, and so, like I said, I can cover any other details in the overall uh, packet. Like I said, there's a ton of information uh, in there on their study. Uh, the alternatives that they analyzed um, back in July of last year, they had a study that was, uh, we thought, a little flawed. They did make some changes, updated a few things, reflecting uh, the water rates that were put in place by this um, council for the increases over the next five years for the water treatment facility that we've all been talking about for a number of years. So it's been updated. Um, it's still a little light on what their long-term costs are going to be, um, but they have committed to provide the assurances necessary to do that. So we look for your direction on uh, completing negotiations on a water sales agreement um, or uh, saying no and going back to tell the state no and see where things land. It's kind of the two options that we have today. I'm available right. for any questions you may have. Well, thank you. Um, just a few comments I have on this. As, as you know, this, this has been a hot topic for me and one that um, I vehemently disagree with the state. A state always seems to have all the right answers when it's their way. Um, this is the same authority that wants to take the water from us, but then turns around and tells us that we need to supply others with water. So I have a fundamental issue with that. Beyond that, first and foremost, I'm here to want to help in whichever way we can. But what the state is asking us to do flies in the face of everything that they make us do in vetting the sequel process and providing you know, uh, assurances that we can uh, supply water to our residents. Now they want us to provide a service connection over a mile outside our city limits to an area that I would say, okay, let's go through the process like everybody else has to, where you have to annex in order to be able to provide services to those. Because where does it stop? You open up Pandora's box and how many other situations like this do we have? And now all of a sudden we're gonna have tentacles all outside the city. It's just a recipe for disaster if something happens to one of those lines and those residents can't pay to fix it. And now we have to have the, res the rest of the series residents pick up the tab for it. So I'm going to go out and say I am 100 and 20% against this, but the state, um, you know, holds the ability to approve our surface water plant that impacts all the other residents. And so to say that they have us over a barrel is probably an understatement. So the only way that I can support this, and I believe you've indicated that the property owner has said such, that he puts the backstops in place that protects all the rest of the series residents um, and assures that we're not picking up the tab for something that wasn't planned or that they couldn't be doing themselves. Just so that everybody understands, they have a well out there and they can, they can treat their own water just like we're treating ours, but they choose not to do that because this is an easier answer. And they've lined up with the state and, uh, and, and, and are forcing this issue, so. Um, I believe if we say no, we'll have to face litigation and be forced to do it anyway. So um, yeah, so the only way, again, I can support it is if we make assurances that the backstops are in place like Monterey Track um, was, and I'm hearing you say that they are. So um, reluctantly, I will support it. I would um, appreciate it if you go to the meeting and, and, um, and uh, if, at any time the owner does not want to do that or the state wants to push something off again on us and relieve them of some of responsibility, then bring it back to us and I would say, no, we'll fight it. And if we lose, we lose. But um, I think the message needs to be out there that um, the state can't always bully around and on one hand say they're gonna take you know, our unimpaired flow of water and then on the other hand, they want us to supply it because they don't want to have to do their job, which is, you know, help out a disadvantaged community that, you know, that, that they should be at the, at the table dealing with. So anyway, are there any comments from any of the other council members on this item? Just uh, one, Mayor. On the backstop, Toby, you mentioned that funds will be deposited for up to six months. Now, if they're established, if they're used in any way, will that, whatever that amount is, will it remain whole? At all the time. Yeah, the, the concept would be a deposit of 
at least six months uh, that would be in the city account, and if that were to ever, if we had to use that for any reason, then we would demand it be replenished so that we always so it had that. Yeah. So it would always stay there. It would always stay that amount. So uh, kind of the thought process that we had was that we would actually make the payment from that deposit, and then they're always refilling that deposit with their month. That's one of the frameworks we uh, talked about, and we've got to work out some details on how that works, but the idea was that we would always have that money in that account, so it would at least give us six months if something catastrophic went wrong, say a bankruptcy or something like that, we have six months, and if council's uncomfortable with that, then maybe we push for a year. Um, with Monterey Park Track, we ended up with a $75,000 deposit um, that's for that same protection. A um, little different range, a little different magnitude, but um, you just their, their water usage, which is a lot higher there than what it is uh, at Series West, but um, that parameter we could, we could adjust as council's um, comfort level. Feel a little more secure though, because the county is actually the backstop on that too. I, I would prefer a year because by the time something happens, six months will be evaporated. Yeah, that's and my... then the political pressure of us not supplying water to this community, and I mean, you know, w what happens if we came up with a situation where we're raising the rates and the property owner said, "I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay for the rate increase." and refuses to and then six months goes and we've used up his money and then we've got to supply him water while all the other residents have to take the rate increase and those are some provisions that we would build into that water sales agreement so that basically it would be in default if any of that did happen but and that's when we want to record that agreement as well so it runs with the land okay. so yeah. I, I think if he defaults in any way we're able to do that so uh, i'd be 100 percent comfortable with a 12 month um, and that's we're, we're putting that security for the actual water service payment and then we're also looking for security of the long-term maintenance of the line because it, it will be a hundred percent constructed by them you know, the only thing that we're inspecting is the connection to our service 3,000 foot of private line in county right-of-way is hundred percent on them maintained by them and we want to ensure that there's provisions in place for that as well so that that's backstopped we don't want to be responsible for that maintenance but somebody needs to be on the hook for that to ensure that that's done um, so we don't want something coming you know 15 years down the road a farmer hits that line and they're calling us to fix it that's got to be on that that owner's responsibility so that's one of the key provisions of a backstop not just on the payment but also on the long-term maintenance of the facility right and i think you know too you know it's a possibility we are opening up pandora's box we don't know um, so I think it should be difficult and I think it should be costly. I think every bit of it should be, every thought that we have should go into, and it's not to punish the people out there at all. It's just that we have a responsibility to the residents of our, our city. And um, so, you know, I would hope that we'll just put all the thought we can into it. And it seems like you guys are going the right direction. Appreciate that. So again, I'm like the mayor, I don't like it. I don't like the state telling us to do anything. However, in this case, I know that uh, <coughs> It would be probably come very costly and we'd probably lose but however if the state just wants to keep jamming it i'd be willing to sit here um before my term's up right and uh and tell the state to stick it basically because it's getting to be enough um however though I, you're going the right direction so i will support it any other comments before i open it up to the public okay is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item Gene Yakely, I understand what you're saying about the the mobile home park and everything like that, but for this layman of myself and the people behind me, maybe is there going to be any cost that the city's going to have to put out? I mean, it's it hasn't happened yet. I understand that, but what's a, the proposal? What it might cost just to get it going on the city side of finance? There, they have to pay for the Every extension day? of the line to that and the maintenance that's what we're talking about so from yeah. where our city limit and the line ends they have to take it out a little over a mile and then would be responsible for the maintenance of that line should something happen to it so the city won't have any cost at all then just staff cost yeah. Just, yeah. What? just staff costs but they will also pay a connection fee and an inspection fee for the staff time that's out there on the field but primarily right now what has not been covered would be staff time myself jeremy tom um, that have been working on this so and, and these lines will be inspected on a annual basis 
Uh, well, that would be a private line. That's what we're putting the provision in place because that's not, that would not be the city's. Our only responsibility would be the physical connection, just like any other connection in the city All would right. be actually be the backflow, which would be checked on an annual basis. That's required by state law. Um, and that physical connection, our, our staff would but make. But that associates with uh, cost, too, to the city, Correct. Right? Where it becomes a little bit of a challenge is typically the private line we have is from the street to your house, so it's not a big deal. When you're going over it's a, a mile bigger, long, bigger house property, 15, 20 years from now, something happens to that line, and you're one of the 50 residents there, fix you're going to call up the city and you're going to complain about it, and you're going to want the city to go fix it. And if you don't have the 50 grand it's going to take to fix it, you're going to scream bloody murder that the city's not providing me with my water. Yep, just like a home. So. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? John Warren, the question is, you got 50 residents out there, and each one of them, when they purchase or they sell, they go through escrow. Is there anything in place that would be in those escrow papers when a new person purchases a property there, or rents, that they're made to understand what the agreement is? We're only dealing with one entity because it's a private mobile home park. So unlike the Monterey Track Park, as Mr. Wells said, where it's a district, we're dealing with one entity. So we're trying to put everything in place that says if that entity, once it gets in place, if he turns around and sells it to somebody else, to somebody else, to somebody else, that they're still governed by what we have put in place. But... A scenario could be all 50 of them make the monthly payment and he chooses not to pay the city then it would be a recorded agreement though yes. so it would show yeah. up on a title report as a flag of that that restriction is recorded against the property any title company is going to see that restriction and that would get flagged in the title process that's why we want to record that agreement. I understand the property but when a person moves in and out of a mobile home park they own the mobile home in some cases yeah depends on the situation so again, as ownership, that would be shown on a title report. Um, a, a lease, not necessarily, but a lease is just a renting ownership and it. it's the owner who needs to buy that. So it depends on how those coaches are owned within that particular mobile home park on whether that notice would be given. But a title company is going to flag it because that agreement is recorded. So something could possibly be put into place that we required each person that rents, owns, or whatever in each one of those 50 spots that their signature goes on a piece of paper when the ownership or whatever changes. No, so impossible for us. We can't require that because we don't have jurisdiction over that. Mobile homes are, are um, governed by HCD, Housing Community Development at the state, so we don't have the ability to put that, but we will do everything on our power to ensure that agreement is you know, recorded against the land so that the landowner has that responsibility to notice his tenants, but we don't have the physical right to tell them that. But, but that's what we'll put in that agreement to when they call up and want us to fix the line you're telling them that here's the number to call here's the number of the owner thank you yeah. anyone else okay i'll bring back to the council for direction or do you need us to take a motion i would prefer a motion just so it's documented um of, of what you did so i have that um you want a motion on it would yeah just a motion to complete negotiations for our water sales agreement okay i move um, that we allow staff to complete negotiations for the agreement for the mobile home park with requesting with, with, a year with requesting of a year yeah second can we have a motion and a second can we have the roll call vote please councilmember de Rosset? yes councilmember lane yes councilmember rhino yes and mayor Vieira. yes motion passes four zero Okay, the next new business item is the fire apparatus replacement. Mr. Wells. Thank you, Mayor. This evening, uh, Battalion Chief Serpa is going to give a presentation. Uh, Council, you have the staff report as well as uh, the highlight of the um, presentation in your binder uh, this evening. Uh, Battalion Chief Serpa will run through that and uh, answer any questions you have. We're looking for, uh, as indicated in the staff report, it's been uh, many years, 12 years, since we've bought a new piece of fire apparatus. Um, and our equipment is showing its age um, rather regularly uh, on an, uh, a too regular basis. So um, he'll run through the presentation and we'll look for your uh, direction on uh, several options. So, Chief Serpa. Thank you, uh, City Manager Wells, 
Uh, Mayor and City Council, thanks for having us here. Um, this PowerPoint's gonna go over the uh, fire apparatus replacement program for the Sirius Fire Department and what it entails, um, you know, what actually an apparatus replacement program is, um, the age of our current fleet, um, the reliability concerns, out of service time cost of our current fleet that, we're, that we have, <clears throat> what the replacement fleet would look like uh, as we move into the future, uh, potential purchasing timeline, and also the funding mechanism. And then I'll be able to answer any questions that you have. So actually, what is an apparatus uh, replacement program? It's a comprehensive, uh, very detailed program for the specification purchase and uh, replacement of fire apparatus in a timely manner. Uh, as with any vehicle, uh, fire apparatus do have a, a lifespan, um, so they, they do wear out. Um, we have recommendations based on industry standard, uh, but an apparatus replacement program uh, also entails usually an annual money allotment based off of uh, the need of the fire department spread over a specific amount of time, usually 10 years. Uh, that is the industry standard for uh, frontline apparatus, the apparatus that go out every day um, that we have at every station. <clears throat> By doing that, you're, you're allotting a specific amount of money every year uh, based off of the program so that we don't have huge balloon costs uh, like what we've run into today. Um, so every two or three years, you would normally purchase a piece of apparatus and that way you would spread it out over a specific amount of time. Um, and again, refrain from these massive lump purchases. <clears throat> when we do look at vehicle replacement, we look, we, we look at several items and trigger points that signal that the vehicle needs to be replaced. Um, first and foremost is the repair cost. Uh, as you probably know with your own cars, um, when the vehicle starts to get older, kind of the old adage is it's nickel and diming you to death. Well, we've run into the where we are spending tens of thousands of dollars at every turn uh, to, re to repair these vehicles, to keep them in service. So repair costs is one uh, trigger point that we look at, out of service time, so the amount of time that it's actually spending not responding to calls, sitting in the shop, uh, versus in service time, the amount of time it sits in the fire station uh, available, the age of the apparatus, and then any change in NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association guidelines. And in this case, we are uh, referencing NFPA 1901, which is the standard for motorized fire apparatus. <clears throat> so our program should be reviewed annually uh, to be adjusted for all uh, cost and inflation. Um, generally speaking, for fire apparatus, you're looking at anywhere between three to 5% uh, on an annual basis is what the, uh, the price goes up annually. Uh, there are also uh, price increases for, as in 2008, when the new emission standards came down from the EPA. You'll see a huge swing. Uh, during that, uh, that 2008, we saw roughly a fifty dollars to $75,000 increase per vehicle uh, for these emission standards, and we have to abide by those again. They're a na uh, national EPA standard. So what does our fleet look like today? Um, as of uh, September 24th, 2018. So engine 15, uh, which is the primary apparatus out of station 15 here downtown, uh, was purchased in 2006, currently has over 130,000 miles on it and 12,000 hours. Uh, engine 16, which was rotated out there uh, to our Pecos Avenue station uh, just like, uh, about four years ago, um, currently a 2007 with 80, roughly 82,000 miles on it. Our, our ladder truck, which is the Quint, um, currently has 114,000 miles on it, was purchased, used, a year, a year old uh, in 2003. It was actually built in 2002. <clears throat> Again, 12,000 hours on it. Our Type 6 brush engine, which was purchased and built in 2003, uh, has just over 15,000 miles and is currently out of service. Um, about a month ago, uh, the motor uh, basically blew up um, while the gentlemen were on a strike team, had no, it just happened to be there when it, when it happened. It would have happened here versus anywhere else. Um, but with that um, 
fleet, the fleet staff and both the fire department agree that uh, this particular motor that, that was built by the manufacturer has these, these problems. So it's not anything that's abnormal uh, for, this, for this particular motor, uh, but it is going to be costly to repair it, and we do not feel at this time that that is, that is in the best interest of the city. Our current rescue truck, uh, which is our, our medium duty rescue that we, that we use for specialty rescue, vehicle accidents, things like that, uh, was built in 1999. <clears throat> our two reserve engines, engine 217 is a 2003. It's been rotated into reserve status with 133,000 miles on it. And reserve engine 216, which is a 1996. Uh, that is correct. It is 22 years old and has 150,000 miles on it. Again, the fire department has not purchased uh, a piece of major apparatus in about 12 years. So when we look at mileage, mileage is one indicator, but the hours are also another indicator of the, of the vehicle use. Uh, industry standard is roughly 55 miles for each hour on the hour meter. So as an, ex as an example, engine 15 has roughly six, almost 700,000 miles on it. When you look at the amount of time that it, is, it has been running uh, and operating in its life. <clears throat> So where are we at today? Where, where does this bring us? We currently have a fleet that has uh, become extremely costly to repair and it has become unreliable. <clears throat> we have kept this apparatus in service well beyond what it's been designed for. Uh, the city, both the city and the fire department have been forced to do that due to the financial state of the city in the last eight to 10 years. So again, NFPA 1901, the standard for motorized fire apparatus uh, across the country uh, is, is the yardstick that we use uh, to measure, uh, or one, excuse me, one yardstick we use to um, gauge our fire apparatus. <clears throat> that standard, 1901, says that most fire apparatus, as in major pieces of equipment, pumpers, aerials, water tenders, brush rigs, things of that sort, should see, ser should see 10 years of frontline service. So that is day-to-day -day responding to every call that comes in for that particular station. Once they hit that 10-year mark, they should be rotated into reserve status, so used when uh, vehicles are in repair or we need a, a piece of equipment to be backfilled for a major incident and so on and so forth. <clears throat> the out-of-service time that we're seeing with our current fleet is starting to have an effect on our daily operation. Uh, crew efficiency, and also response times. We have days where we are changing out of uh, fire engines two to three times every day. Um, and that's only because of the, of the staff at fleet doing their best to keep at least one piece of apparatus responding out of every fire station. Um, about three weeks ago, we almost had what we call a dry fire station. So any, any one of our fire, current three fire stations uh, has a piece of pumping apparatus in it. We had so many vehicles in the shop broke down, we almost had to put our rescue truck into service. Normally that wouldn't be a big deal because we could put grass 15 in service with it. So we would have some type of water. But for a few hours during that day, we, were, we had what we call a dry station. We had no pumping apparatus responding out of one of our fire stations. Apparatus have been cost prohibitive to maintain, as you can see, <clears throat> our repair cost for the last five years has skyrocketed. And that is simply because of the age of the vehicles. Everything is starting to be worn down, breaking, um, parts are wearing out. And what we're seeing is a huge labor cost of those hours it's taking. And, it's, and we're talking more than just a few hours here or a few hours there. When we have to rebuild, uh, as in just a few months ago, we had to rebuild the front end out of one of our fire engines. It took fleet staff six weeks to, make, to disassemble the, the vehicle, wait for parts, proprietary parts to come from back east, and then physically put the vehicle back together. So we were out of service for six weeks. So what would new apparatus do for us? <clears throat> the apparatus committee has worked for the last roughly 24 months uh, to develop specifications for new apparatus. And we've looked at several different uh, items to, to try and bring down the cost 
the long, the, not only the initial purchase, but also the long-term cost of maintenance of these vehicles. We work closely with the staff at, at Fleet, uh, I think for the first time in the history of the department, or the history of the city, that they've had a seat at the table uh, when we go to design these fire engines. <clears throat> so we, we are developing, or we have developed uh, specifications that are, are maintenance friendly. So they're easy to repair. If there is something that we could do to make it easier for them to repair it, we've done that. We've looked at individual, we've done a component evaluation, which means that we look at how easy is it to get parts for these, for these fire engines. We don't want a proprietary part. We want a part that we can go down to a major truck supplier and pick up for a fraction of the cost and, be, and have it within hours of, of needing it, potentially. So hours instead of weeks or days. Again, spe uh, specify the use of non-proprietary uh, parts to reduce costs. And here's an example. It's kind of a, a basic example, but it, it gives you a, uh, an eye for what, we're, what fleet and the fire department's up against. One simple switch for Quint 18. It's a proprietary part. Cost the city $165 to replace it. Fleet did a quick uh, search on the internet, found the same part, same basic part, but it, because it's proprietary, certain things are different and it won't fit. They found the same part for $20. So that's what we're dealing, at, dealing with with our current fleet. So we've created apparatus that, that should be in the shop less and in, increase in service time. Allow shop staff to concentrate on other needed repairs uh, for other uh, city departments. And we've also created functional apparatus for our personnel. So what will new apparatus do for us? <clears throat> On the short term, one to five years, it will reduce um, the maintenance costs that we're incurring right now due to the new vehicle warranties. So generally speaking, industry standard is a one year bumper to bumper uh, warranty. With the powertrain, which is the motor and the transmission, we can see a five-year warranty, uh, 20 years on the body, lifetime on an area ladder, so on and so forth. We estimate that we could reduce the maintenance, the annual maintenance cost by roughly 25%, possibly even 30% by purchasing new apparatus. So that those funds could be parlayed over into our uh, either our lease payment or purchase, <coughs> so on and so forth. Um, Roughly 8 to 10 percent reduction in fuel consumption with the new motors, more efficient, um, use less fuel, <clears throat> more reliable fleet, and more in-service time with less out-of-service time. And again, more cost-effective apparatus for the city. So what are our recommendations for, um, from the fire department and fleet to the city council? We need the following apparatus, and by, by need, I'm not saying we would like to have this. It'd be a really nice thing to, to, to have. This is what we feel is critically needed. Um, two type one fire engines, <clears throat> a quint ladder truck, brush engine, a new chassis for our, grass, for our grass engine. And the chassis is the absolute bare minimum cost to get a new vehicle, uh, to, to replace that vehicle. If we were actually to go out and try and purchase a new vehicle to replace that with, we would looking, be looking at least double, if not triple the cost. So we are absolutely trying to, to keep costs down at every turn. A new SUV for the fire chief, and then we would at the same time surplus the following vehicles. All three of our reserve engines, the Quint and Rescue 18. So new apparatus costs, a type one fire engine today will cost us roughly $600,000. A new Quint ladder truck is $1,050,000. The type uh, one and three brush engine would be $370,000. The new chassis for the grass is roughly $75,000 and same with the fire chief's SUV. It's for an estimated cost of $2.7 million. Sales tax added to that and with the addition of the equipment that is needed, um, as you have seen in the staff report, uh, when we last purchased apparatus between 2003 and 2006, 
we basically took the equipment off of the old engines or the older engines and put it onto the new, uh, the new engines we bought at the time. What we're seeing now is literally every time we go to use a piece of equipment, it breaks. A uh, perfect example of this is we've had two pin in accidents on the freeway in the last eight days. Each one of those accidents, we broke tools because they're so old. And what, what do we do? We just come back and we fix it. We do the best we can with what we're given. So we've just basically, we have come to the end of the line with a lot of our equipment, mostly our apparatus, but a lot of our equipment as well. So that's where that number comes in, is we need to replace the equipment that is on these older engines. And there's our total cost. And then here's basic diagrams and drawings of what uh, we are looking at to purchase. The Type 1 engine is in the top left-hand corner. It's our structural engines. It's what goes on every call that you see. Um, has, it's based, they're all set up for what we call all hazard response. They can take care of any call that comes along, uh, be it EMS or medical, rescue type calls, fire calls, so on and so forth. <clears throat> the ladder truck on the bottom, it uh, will go out at our station 18. Again, used for just as much for reach as it is for height. Um, again, with all landscape setbacks, uh, commercial structures, uh, even two-story homes, with all of the, uh, of the ve vehicles parking in the street, plus the sidewalk landscape setbacks, we need our ladder truck as much for reach as we do height. So what could, we, uh, what could you as a council expect to, uh, from, from us if, if this program is approved? Uh, we could potentially have these vehicles bid and a contract signed uh, by the end of uh, October. Once a purchase order is signed, it will take roughly 365 to 390 days to build and deliver the apparatus here to series. Uh, <laughs> Most all apparatus are built back east, um, and then they're driven out here to California where they go to a, to a specific dealer, and then anything that needs to be repaired from that drive out is repaired, and then they are delivered to a uh, series. We don't go back anymore uh, in years past. Uh, personnel have gone back and actually driven the apparatus out. Uh, what has happened now is that is considered the delivery. When we take, when we drive something like that out, and we did it mainly to reduce cost, but we are now taking the liability of, of driving that out and anything that happens to that vehicle on its way out is now our responsibility. So almost 100% of fire departments have the builder bring that vehicle out to California. <clears throat> Once the apparatus arrive here in series, it will take us roughly 60 to 90 days to mount the equipment and do the required training. Uh, for our personnel. So our in-service goal would be roughly February 1st of 2020. Um, so you can see, even if, if, if you told us go tonight, we still have a long way to go to get these vehicles here to series. So funding options, uh, we, we feel that the outright purchase, so basically writing a, a check, is uh, cost prohibitive. It's not, it just won't work for us. We feel that the lease purchase is the best option for us. It spreads the cost of these vehicles out over the next 10 years. So the, the principal cost would be roughly $295,000 for, for what we're uh, presenting tonight based on current prices. And then you would, if you uh, chose to lease purchase through a third party uh, finance company, you would have the finance charges up on top of that. So one thing we want to point out um, is that if strike team money could be used to assist in making these payments, uh, for example, uh, for calendar year 2017, over and above what it cost us to send the personnel and vehicle maintenance and repair, the fire department contributed $111,000 to the city's general fund. So we could potentially, if we were allowed to continue to go on strike teams, <coughs> take that money that's been earned and turn around and throw it right back into our apparatus replacement program, which is, uh, you know, I think a great idea. We could also use uh, consortium or uh, group purchasing. 
um, such as uh, Houston Galveston Area Contract or NJPA. These are all consortiums that basically bid everything from fire engines to pencils. And cities have the, cities, counties, government agencies have access to these consortiums and it basically reduces the lead time as far as we don't have to go out to bid, we can just pick something off of uh, one of these consortiums to, to purchase and we don't have to go out to bid. Everything's been, been bid, it's been legally vetted. Um, it's a very, very common um, occurrence. We can also just continue to fund uh, repairs on the current fleet. Um, with that, um, again, we could, we could put a significant amount of money from what we are paying today for uh, repair into that potential lease payment or paying for these vehicles. Um, if not, we are going to need an increase in the internal service fund that goes to fleet because of the increased cost of having to repair these older vehicles. So that in a nutshell, again, very quick, uh, is what an apparatus replacement program is. That is what the fire department needs. And uh, right now I can answer any of your questions. The $295,000, that's for replacement of all the units? That's for what we, what we showed you here. That would be for the two type one engines, the ladder truck, the type three, uh, the chassis for the grass rig and the and the fire chief's SUV. And the lease purchase, is it a dollar buyout or what's the amount? No, that would be a lease purchase. So at I the end of the 10 years. But what, what is the purchase at the end of that 10 year period? You make equal payments over the 10 years. So there, it's not a, it's not a lease as to you would have a, uh, a lump sum payment at the end. So you pay the 295000 for 10 years, and at the end, you own it? That's correct. Okay. That's, that's been the preferred. So it's a finance. It's not really a lease. That's correct. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a banker. Okay. Uh, I just know that's how it works. Um, the mechanism is looking for your direction, and we would bring back, when we, with the contract, we'd bring back actual details of showing exactly what the interest rate, what those costs are, because obviously there's several different funding mechanisms that we can use, and I mean, there's some other parameters out there, seven years, 10 years, some go a little longer. They start to get more cost prohibitive from a um, financing charge, so 10 years has been kind of preferred. But there's several options there. Obviously, we'd want to work real closely with uh, Suzanne and the finance team to find the right mechanism. It was mentioned in the staff report also, you know, we have a very large fund balance in our sewer department for some long-term capital improvement projects. Um, we may be able to couple those two either as a straight loan internal, when we just pay ourselves our own interest. Um, that might be more cost effective or a combination where if we loaned ourselves a million dollars, which allowed us to have a little more flexibility of a $2 million purchase, those are kind of the, the dials that we're looking for, your willingness on the financing side well, kind of to, to kind of talk about, you know, basically we need to know the magnitude that you're looking for. Are you comfortable kind of going all in and then we find the best financing package to accomplish that? or do we want to step back? So I know that's a, a lot to your question, but there, there's a lot more on the financing side. We just felt if we got into too many of those details, we, we would get in a little too far out in front of the council. We want to make sure that you're comfortable with direction and then we can bring you financing options for the final decision. Councilman Moreno? Well, we're definitely way overdue for our equipment to be replaced. My only concern would be that we haven't, we don't have the finance director here tonight to discuss what the financial issues could be for us, but we obviously have to go ahead. So do we give the go ahead for everything and then when she's back from vacation, then she's involved in what financially would be best for the city. Yeah, and that's what I discussed with her. We obviously didn't get into the details and said, look, we need to get council on board um, and then how it's financed and the details, that's where her expertise is and there's those options. Um, and, you know, she's comfortable with, you know, in a general parameter, but obviously we need to build that into the budget and that's the challenge with this is building it into next year's budget, right? Because the actual costs come into fiscal year 1920. We actually don't see much on the cost side on the front end. 
So that's why we're asking now because of that long lead time. And we always have to go out of state to get a fire engine. They aren't built in California. There are a few. Um, the, the bigger question and is to the service and support of, of those of those vehicles. Are those the ones that are proprietary? Most of the proprietary builders are back east. Um, we also look at um, the service and support end. We don't want to have to, uh, when the, the vehicle needs uh, service or repair while it's under warranty, we don't want to have to drive it to the Bay Area or somewhere you know, a long ways away. Uh, we'd like to drive it to either Modesto or maybe Oakdale uh, for repair based on who, who uh, bids on the vehicles. Um, but we, we have a builder in mind, but um, we would like it to be bidded, you know, either through the consortium purchase or through the bid. Well, we definitely would have to do one of those, but it's almost like we're, are we going to allow enough bids if we, it looks like we would bid and the purchase contract would be signed in a month? I mean, that seems pretty fast. And we, we need to be sure that we put it out there so that we could get the most responsible bidder, correct? That's correct. We have the specifications ready to go. Uh, we could, I could hand those tomorrow morning to uh, City Manager Wells and also uh, Mr. Damis and Fleet. Um, again, we, the, the apparatus committee, which is comprised of um, a great cross-section of personnel from the fire department, uh, firefighters, engineers, captains, um, myself, uh, again, Fleet, um, we're ready. Well, you might be ready, but don't we need to allow people who are going to bid on it enough time to do that as well? Because you, you know exactly what you want, but they're going to get this fresh, fresh package and they're going to need some time to put together a bid. They do. Okay. They, um, generally speaking, uh, two to three weeks is plenty of time um, for, for bids to be out for, for this particular um, type of vehicles that were it's it's nothing like super special that we're that we're looking for it's very uh, basic firefighter friendly maintenance friendly um, it won't take them very long think of options on a car right when you're going to buy a new car it's I mean I'm simplifying it it's it's much more different but they're used to deal this is all they do they're used to dealing with these options that most fire departments have put together so it's oh that's similar to Wichita Kansas or, or whatever it is so they it's not like going from scratch. So then putting these bids together is a relatively straightforward process. When, when we go out to bid for um, fleet vehicles, mm -hmm. how long generally is our bid open for that? Well, those are generally <laughs> quotes over the phone. We get them the next day a lot of times. We're buying everything out of state. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's where the consortium, so either like Houston Galveston area contract, uh, NJPA, if that's the, the way that the council would like to go, uh, we could, you could give us the authorization to get prices, and we could probably have that back to you in a couple of weeks at the very outset. And are we guaranteed to get a lower price by going through the consortium versus just going out to bid? You will get just as good a price as you would if you went out to bid. But by doing that, do we leave out any potential local builder? No. Um, if, you know, with, with his consortium purchasing, uh, it's very common that, that uh, you know, most, most manufacturers um, are part of those. It's just which one are they part of. Um, NJPA is, is one that the city has used before. Uh, Houston Galveston is what uh, Modesto purchased their, their fire apparatus out of, off of. Um, you could even uh, piggyback. Piggybacking is, is another form of uh, purchasing that fire departments and, and government agencies use. And we basically 
you know, use somebody like Alameda County, uh, we, we basically piggyback onto their bid um, to purchase. So there's several different ways to do it. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily leave anybody out. Um, I think part of our bid package would be that uh, we would want a service center within, I would say, 50 miles. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, that the city has the final say in any, you know, any bid. Um, we would have to re, you know, evaluate it, make sure that they meet the bid. Um, our package that we have currently um, has each manufacturer has to say yes or no that they meet our, our specification. And it's mostly just component based. Uh, there's really not uh, anything that's special about any of our apparatus that we've specified here. So there's more than a consortium. There's different there consortiums. Are, there are different ones, yes, ma'am. So can you, are, are there a bunch of them? Or is there just a couple that um, agencies the, the, would the use? The two that, that stand out, the ones that get used the most are the NJPA and the Houston Galveston, or H, they call it HGAC. HGAs. Could we do both of them at the same time or not? Um, you wouldn't have to. You could either pick one or the other. And um, you would still get the same you kind get of just response? About the same price. Okay. Yeah, Those are my only questions. Again, they, they do, they bid everything from literally pencils to fire engines to, I mean, everything. Um, and it's, it's, it costs a fee, but uh, sometimes. Uh, depending on the manufacturer, those manufacturers will pick up that cost. Okay. Councilmember Lane? Okay, a couple of things. First of all, I get the RFP. You're not going to go out there and do an RFP. It's already been done. These companies that have bid have been awarded the contracts, right? The manufacturers that you're talking about, whether it's the JPAs or, you know, your piggyback and whatever it may be. That's saving us a lot of money, obviously. Money and time. To, right? Money and time. That's, that's critical, right? So I get that being a part of not vehicles but other things I understand that um, so I'm okay with whichever direction you guys are gonna go you guys know your needs better than than I do obviously um, and it sounds like you've really kind of searched this out and and so forth so and I agree with uh, Miss Rhino if there's somebody local that we can deal with that'd be great right but I don't know that there is you guys will know that um, but you know we're talking about replacement and I you know, I, I agree it's time to get this stuff replaced, and it's going to be a while, obviously, but we're going to have to get it moving, and you know, hopefully in February or March of 2020, you guys will have all this new equipment in. So, But saying that, 10 years from now, right, when this equipment's old again, what are we doing? I'm saying here what we're doing now to replace, but we got to continue, you know, as, as things get older, 10 years down the road, we're going to have to re replace some of these other things. Is that fitting into this plan? Have we thought that far ahead, or, or are we just looking at just trying to get It's going to be very it? difficult to do that because you basically oh, have to okay. double up, right? I mean, right. in order to set aside another apparatus replacement plan, you'd have to, double, in essence, double this to get to there right. at the end of 20 years, and that will be very difficult based on our current financing. You're, because we haven't done an apparatus replacement financing for the past 10 years, puts us in a position where lease purchase is probably the only mechanism going forward for these type of apparatus. And, and mo a lot of departments have figured out that that's not a bad way to do it. it. It's not a huge cost. It does cost more. There's no way about it. It, it does have a, a larger cost because of the financing cost. But all the other needs we have in the city, um, it's about the only option we so, really have. Yeah, so with the number, we can look at that number as being a part of our budget for for now on, it, it's, actually. Well, it's been in All there right? for, I exactly. Mean, and once you're building in that lease arrangement right. on a, an annual basis, continuing it on an annual basis yeah. is kind of forcing yourself to, to put money that. towards that. You're just going to be doing that purchase process rather than putting it into a savings account. Right. Okay. Osmo Drossa? Yeah, this is a good plan, by the way. I appreciate it. It's easy to read. Um, <clears throat> the older engines. Can we do something with the older engines, though? I mean, can we sell them? <coughs> yes. Um, part of this plan is to take the engines that are that are still viable and to to sell them. Uh, the ladder truck, the rescue truck, um, at least one of the reserves uh, is still in serviceable shape. Uh -huh. um, that you know, some small department would would probably purchase it. Um, a couple of the engines. Um, 
reserve engine 230, uh, excuse me, 231 and 232 are done. Uh, one's 22 years old and the other is 27 years old. Uh, those engines, I would be surprised if we could get $10,000 for them. Um, and that is based, that is very much stretching that. Um, another option would be to take those, you know, sell the other three and possibly donate the two that really aren't worth anything um, and possibly donate them to like the RFTC, the Regional Fire Training Center here in Modesto. Uh, they're always in, in, you know, in need of engines to train our, our future firefighters uh, and that's, that's definitely an option. Um, I think we could get enough from the ladder truck, the rescue truck, and that one uh, reserve engine that uh, we could potentially at least pay for the equipment costs and possibly some of the first year of the lease purchase payment or whatever is decided. And then one last thing, the, uh, <clears throat> are there any other cities doing the same thing currently, whereas they have to purchase or lease lots uh, of equipment? Several local uh, agencies just here within our local area do the lease purchase. Uh, Modesto did a straight lease with theirs. So uh, as you were saying, Mr. Mayor, uh, they did a 10-year lease, so at the end of the 10 years, they owe that balloon payment. Um, several other agencies, uh, Ripon, uh, Stanislaus Consolidated, uh, Houston Fire District, they've done uh, some variation of the lease purchase as far as, uh, as far as the term. Five years, seven years, 10 years, whatever it may be, whatever they can afford. But it's very, very common in the fire service to do the lease purchase. All right, thank you. Well, I think it needs to be done, and I think, um, you know, I would support you bringing back them with the options uh, for us to look at. But before we make that decision, I want to open it up to the public to see if anyone would like to comment on this item. Okay. Seeing none. Again, uh, my comment is I think it's long overdue and we need to do it. So my recommendation was that we move forward with it and you bring us back some of those financing, financing terms. terms. A couple points of clarification. Um, on the chief SUV and the um, the grass rig chassis, those at the $75 range, would you like to see those kind of as a full package of this or separate those two out and kind of pursue those I would like separately? To separately, maybe. Yeah, because the, they're less. For, they're a little less, and we, from a financing perspective, we can find some other mechanisms to, to get those accomplished and the grass rig especially. Uh, we'd like to move forward on that quicker. If we can yeah. get that chassis, the Ford F, the F550 is a little easier to accomplish and we can move on that a little quicker than these the bigger ones. So from a grand scheme of things, you move forward, but kind of moving on parallel paths and just clarifying that that would be helpful for staff so that we can kind of divide and conquer on getting yes. those things done. Do you want to vote on this or do you want just direction? Um, it was set up for a vote, but I just was really looking for direction. So as long as we're all comfortable with it, we'll bring you back the financing and you'll take action on that. Um, Councilmember Rhino? I'll, I'll defer to you guys. I agree with everything, um, but as far as the SUV for the fire chief, can we wait until we have a fire chief? It, there's a lead on those. I, I really don't want to put a new fire chief in the old SUV because that is a, um, the reason we, it's a we little infested. wanted we'll to bring this to you right now is one, that it's one package and two, it gives fleet because they do, they are going to do the upfit on the fire chief's SUV. It's the most economical way to do it, um, to give them time to purchase the vehicle and get it here and have enough time to upfit it with lights, sirens, things like that. Same thing with the F550 chassis for the grass rig. Um, it's, it's out of service right now, and they're going to be doing all of the retrofit right. work. And again, it's the cheapest way that we could get this vital piece of equipment. Uh, we want to give them plenty of time this winter um, to get that in between repairing vehicles, you know, everything that they do, um, to give them time to get the box off, uh, get the box repainted, um, so on and so forth and have that vehicle ready by uh, no later than April 1st, May 1st at the very outset. Tom, do you want to vote? I think at this point direction is fine then a formal okay. vote at the financing. Okay, so do you have a, the direction you need? Yep. Yeah. Okay, all right. 
Um, council member referrals, is there anyone on the council that would like to have an item placed on a future agenda? Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, reports. I have nothing to report. Council member Rhino? Nothing tonight. Council member Lane? Nothing. Council member Drossett? Nothing. Okay. Well, Tom? Nothing, Mayor. Mr. Wells? Nothing this evening, Mayor. Tom? Just wanted to report that there was a building permit issued uh, for some buildings along 4th Street uh, for new facade improvement just to the south end of 4th Street um, and that uh, construction started today. So hopefully we'd see some new construction starting and taking shape very shortly. Great. Brent? Yes, um, I had the opportunity to swear in three new police officers today. Um, all of them are military veterans. Two are on active uh, reserve status with the Air Force. Uh, they're going to be in training for about 13 weeks. All right. Looking forward to that. Great. Rick? I have nothing, Mayor. Okay. Uh, I think Patina was here, but I don't see her anymore. So, Jeremy? Nothing? Supervisor? Okay. With that, we will move to closed session where we have a conference with labor negotiator and a conference with legal counsel on existing litigation. After that, we will uh, move to adjourn, and then we will be back here for our next regularly scheduled meeting, which will be Monday, October 8th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.